Good evening and welcome to the Speak Easy podcast. I am your host, Constance Woolard, and we are continuing with the celebration for caregivers. Yes, November is National Caregivers Month, and in honor of all caregivers, old and new, no matter where you are around the globe, we salute and celebrate you. And so tonight I have some wonderful guests and panelists here to join us, and they're going to come and share their story about caregiving, talk about their love for caregiving, and why they are so passionate about caregiving. And so our first guest is Dr. Dietrich Gordon, MD, and she's coming tonight to join us and to share with us about her role in advocating for caregiving. So Dr. Gorman, good evening. How are you? And welcome to the Speakeasy podcast. Good morning. Good afternoon, uh, Ms. Candace. Um, Constance, I'm sorry. I'm, it's Dr. Gorman, G-O-R-M-A-N. And thank you so much for having me here on the um, your, your show for this evening. And um, it's just been a, a great experience promoting this book that we're coming out with, uh, this collaboration. And Basically, just a, a brief synopsis of, of who I am. I am actually a family medicine physician. I'm actually practicing out in West Texas, and I'm doing full scope. So what I'm doing is I'm taking care of babies. I even deliver babies. I work in the hospital. I work in the clinic, you know, all the way from, you know, newborn to 100 years old. <laughs> and so I've been out here for uh, quite a few years doing this. And just kind of during my experiences with life and whatnot, you know, this could be a, a, a stressful situation, right? <laughs> um, in addition to that, uh, when my, my parents were alive, I was their caregivers. Um, my father, he actually didn't make it to see me uh, graduate medical school, but I was there for him, you know, up until the end. And then my mom, she was actually out here with me and she passed away. But during that time, I was her caregiver as well while all along, you know, holding a full-time job as a, a physician. So through the course of all this, you know, the, these things can be very stressful. Um, in addition to the workplace stress, you know, dealing with patients and, you know, all kinds of interactions with folks. Um, and so what I've coined myself is to be able to help people, caregivers included, with those stressors, because being stressed chronically can lead to all kinds of issues, mental and health issues. And I was so tickled and happy that I was invited to be a collaborator with this book because one of the things I wanted to to, to bring forth is some relaxation techniques for the caregivers. But I'm just so passionate about caregiving because mainly I really work from the philosophy due unto others. I believe that really nobody wants to be in a position where they're completely dependent on someone for their care. And we don't know what the future holds. I know what, I don't know what the future holds for me. And I might be in a position where I need someone to help me. And so when the opportunity is there to help someone, you know, I want to do that with kindness and compassion. And that's why I'm compassionate. And, and that's why I'm so passionate about caregiving is because I want to be able to help those who can't help themselves in that time. You just don't never know what's going to happen and you don't know what they've gone through. Um, so that's one of the reasons I'm very uh, you know, passionate about caregiving and why I'm uh, pl placing this chapter in the book. <laughs> um, other than that, I'm just happy to be here if you have any questions. Well, I thank you so much um, for joining well, us you. in this collaboration because this is a wonderful collaboration because caregiving yes. is real, caregiving is serious, caregiving can be tiring. There's a lot of adjectives that can describe caregiving, good, bad, and ugly, but it is a necessity, Okay. And we find ourselves, just like that individual who finds himself himself in the position where 
they require the care. They have to totally depend on someone to care for them. That caregiver finds themselves in that position, but from the flip side of the coin where, hey, they are faced with a situation that they must deal with. And they must deal with it with love. They must deal with it the best that they know how. Um, some of them are not professional caregivers, so they don't even know where to start, but they work from the heart. And they're figuring it out as they go. There you go. <laughs> and I'm a firm believer when you operate from the heart and out of a place and space of love, God makes things happen. Okay. And so I thank you so much for what you do. I thank you for collaborating with us in this project. And I thank you for being a guest this evening. I oh, thank well, you so wonderful. Much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and I look yeah. forward to hearing the rest of the, the speakers and adding more uh, information. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And so next we have Sherelle D. Mims, who is the founder of the Global Caregivers Network and the visionary author of For the Love of Caregiving and Sherelle D. Mims. Good evening. How are you? Good evening, Constance. Good evening, everyone listening in the listening audience. I am Sherelle D. Mims. I am, as Constance said, the founder of Global Caregivers Network and Global Caregiver Speakers. You know what, Constance? You can save me for last. We can bring up the wonderful other co-authors. Listen sure. what they have to say, and I can close us out. Thank you okay, so much. Sure. I will do that. So next, I have made a seat who's going to come and share with us this evening. Good evening, Matus. How are you? And welcome. And you're on mute. Oh, uh, there. There you go. Well, there you go. Okay. Uh, it's good to be here again. So it's, it's very good to be here to, again. I'm delighted to be a part of this book, the anthology of Caregive, the love of caregiving. And uh, my story is really all about self-care. And I actually uh, am a family caregiver. I'm a many, I have, I wear many hats like most women, you know, I'm a former hospital administrator and I actually am a, a business owner and I'm the wife of an evangelist, a traveling evangelist. So with that in itself, that's busy. Uh, I became a caregiver to my mom when she suffered a, a, a very fatal fall. And prior to that, my father had been a kidney transplant patient actually Prior to him having a transplant, of course, you know, he was on dialysis and my mother was his caregiver. So she modeled what caregiving should be. And I actually assisted her with my father's mm -hmm. care. We were very blessed to have my father here after he had a transplant for 32 years, which was one of the longest transplants that was in Michigan. And we I, I attribute that to good caregiving. Yes, yeah. I attribute that to good caregiving. And when my mother had her yes. accident, I even though I was still working all my jobs, I actually took care of her. Uh, in the process, I also had some health issues. And so I believe uh, that we all should be our brothers and sisters keepers. And as I noticed myself and looked on what my, my problem with my health issue at the time, I also uh, began to look at other caregivers. And I noticed that many of them were suffering the same thing. And that was we would not caring for ourselves like we should. And this, our bodies are God's temple. So my thing that I often say is that we are our brother's keepers. When I see other people that are going through those challenges with being a family caregiver, I try to encourage them to take care of themselves because that's very important. Uh, caregivers require intentional living. And that means that as we focus on the, the one that we're caring for, we also have to focus first on ourselves so that we will be there for the one that we're caring for. And so in my chapter, I call it the wake up call because it's my story of how I came to a realization that I wasn't caring for myself and I wanted to be there for my mother. And so I needed to take care of myself, find the help, the resources, because there are resources out there, but sometimes as caregivers, we don't know it. And we try to do the whole thing by ourselves but there are resources and we need to be in contact with those resources. And if we don't know them, that's one of the things that you could find out in this book, because there are also people who have, who have those resources that you can contact like myself and Sherelle and others. And we'll be happy to share that with people. I believe we need to take care of the caregiver 
because they are important, important people, and we need them. We need them now and we're going to need them in the future because as this world goes on, as you look at the, the statistics, there's going to be a need for caregivers more and more. There are more people reaching 65 and 70 and with many of those comes those chronic illnesses. So we need to be prepared and we need to prepare our caregivers. Remember, we need to take care of our brothers and sisters. We are their keepers. Yes, yes, self-care, self-care so that we can remain a full vessel absolutely you know, to continue to pour into others. So thank you so much, Mavis, for sharing your story. Thank you. So next, I'm going to bring up Keisha Jackson and let her come and tell her story. Keisha, good evening. How are you? And welcome to the Speakeasy Podcast. Hi, Constance. I'm doing well. Hello, everybody. It's good to see all of my uh, fellow caregivers out there for professional and uh I am a personal caregiver. I started my caregiving journey when I was in the Air Force and um, my mom was diagnosed with stage four and operable lung cancer that had metastasized into her ribs. And so before that, I'd had no clue that my mother even was ill, you know, aside from probably when I was probably about like um, 12 years old, she had uh, kidney stones. But other than that, you know, I never heard of any, you know, she, she just wasn't ill. And so I was going back and forth to care for her long distance, driving, doing everything I could on a weekend, trying to do what I had to do in the military. And um, it just became more of a challenge for both of us. And so I was able to move her in with me, you know, went, got her household goods, moved her down and was able to be able to become her primary caregiver and uh, uh, along with my my two brothers. So caring for my mom, going through that uh that journey, you know, it, in some ways it was the most painful experience that I ever had watching her in pain, watching her call out and say, uh, Keisha, make the pain stop, you know, uh, trying to interact with making sure that she wasn't over medicated or she wasn't being prescribed medicine on top of medicine on top of medicine, you know, asking what is that? Don't give her that, you know, that's making her uh, out of her mind, if I could say it like that. And so it was a lot of uh, learning, uh, caring for my mom. When when I went into the hospital, the doctor had actually given up on her at that time when I walked in there and uh, I asked, what could we expect? And he said, only thing we could expect is life support. And I said, no, I, I just don't receive that. A part of it was because of my flesh, because that was my mother. And I, of course, I didn't want to let her go. But I believe that the Lord was speaking as well to me to fight for my mother. And so I asked her, I said, well, what do you want? And at first she said she was ready to go. And then she's after a, a little more conversation, she said, I think I want to be here a little bit longer. And when she said that, I said, if that's what you want, then that's what's going to happen. We just have to trust God. And so we worked on some things. I was able to get her on some natural products and a couple of different things. And it, the Lord extended her life. She gave us three more years of, of full time to the point when she actually passed, she said, even the stuff that we were giving her, she knew it was helping. She said she was just tired. And I couldn't, I couldn't argue with that. You know, I, I just didn't want to be selfish. So that's how I got started in my caregiving journey, primarily as a primary caregiver. While I was caring for my mother, six months after my mother passed, one of my brothers fell and he was placed on life support. And uh, he had broken some ribs. And so I was going back and forth again, long distance caring for him while I was caring for my little fur child. She was 12 at the time and uh, she had diabetes. So I was caring for her, making sure I was giving her insulin shots twice a day and just doing what I did, you know, still working and trying to manage it all. So that's really how uh, my caregiving journey began. Although I grew up in a big family, my mom was one of 13. My my paternal grandmother was like one of 12. So I had a lot of family on both sides. So to be in that role to support is not new to me, but it was from a primary perspective of being uh, considered a caregiver. So after caring for my mother and my brother in the process of that, I started having a lot of dreams and uh, began to write poems and uh, writing scripts and songs started coming to me. And I also started going to these different conferences. And when I would go to conferences, I knew that there, I noticed that there were a lot of people there, but there were not a lot of people of color there. 
and there were not a lot of men there. And there were a lot, a lot, a lot of resources that was being shared. And I said, our community needs to know about these things. And so what I decided to do was to come up with creative ways to help get the word out. And so I was able to partner with some people and uh, to produce a, a song, uh, a jazz instrumental, a couple songs. It was a Wanda M. Um, um, uh, it reached the uh, Indie Soul chart, and then we re-released it, and uh, it was it made it to uh, Sirius XM. So I was really grateful about that. I'm working with others on books. Uh, again, um, working on scripts for uh, short films and different things like that to just kind of try to help get the word out and to let people know that there are, you're not alone. I always say that as a caregiver, a lot of times you take it in, you hold it in and you don't express what you're going through, or you may feel like you're the only person going through it, but you're not. And just like I said, to just help with creative ways to help get the word out and to support each other as we support each other in this world of caregiving. Well, thank you so much. Now, mm -hmm. I must ask you, Keisha, what is the title of your chapter? The title of my chapter is Healed. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you so much. Now, myself as a collaborating author, um, the title of my chapter is Crucial Decisions. Mm -hmm. Because I had to make some crucial decisions when it came to the care of my father. And they were not easy decisions. And so that's the title of my chapter. Um, I've been a caregiver twice, first for my mother, second for my father, but then I'm also a professional caregiver because I'm a registered nurse by trade. And so those that I care for in the correctional facilities, I'm their caregiver. You know, I, I'm there to make sure that the right policies and procedures are in place to protect them and to make sure that they're receiving the best possible care. And so again, caregivers, I thank each of you for being here tonight. And so next I'm going to bring up Judy Hewitt. I'm going to bring her to stage and let her come and share with us her role as far as being a caregiver advocate. Good evening, Judy. How are you? Hi, good evening. How are you? I'm wonderful. I am so glad to be here among you authors. Uh, this project sounds like it is going to be awesome. Uh, really, really great to hear that. Now, I am, I've am i been in the medical field for over 35 years as my profession on the uh, administrative side. So I have seen firsthand the physical demands that professional caregivers often face. However, it wasn't until I became a caregiver to my mom that I truly understood the challenges that personal caregivers face in their daily lives, recognizing that there, the, there was support that was needed, there was resources, and especially time to recharge, have someone come and help you through those days. Now, in putting both of those together, and I did uh, write a, a chapter in my first anthology about that at caregiving experience. And after speaking about my experience and realizing that there was not enough voices out there for caregivers, then I really took on the advocacy of it. And we formed a program called Self Care for Caregivers International. And what we do is we, well, we launched October 15. And what we did at our first workshop was we were in front of a 55 Oven community. We provided them resources on getting prescriptions uh, reduced. There's a lot of foundations out there that helps with prescription costs to help with, with that. We also were able to include a mental health therapist to talk about the stresses and how to deal with them and provide tools. And then it also took me into speaking with a couple of music and art therapies to see how that would be able of another way to introduce to the caregivers another way of just letting go of that stress, you know, just relieving themselves. And then, of course, we did have uh, spa treatments where we provided them mini massages and facials and things of that nature. Now, 
we do know that the spa element is something that is temporarily it is needed but we really wanted to incorporate the resources as well as the mental health therapies art therapies we also had two licensed uh, Medicare specialists to talk to them about Medicare. It's open enrollment. There's a lot of questions out there with what do I select, what I don't select. You know, certain loopholes that if you're new, you don't know what to do when you need to get your Medicare Part D for your insurance. You know, some people just say, oh, I'm healthy. I don't need Medicare Part D. Well, God forbid something happens. Medicare you usually will charge you for the time that you didn't apply and you penalize throughout the rest of your period. A lot of people are not aware of that little clause in the Medicare Part D. And then we had a life insurance specialist. So collectively, not only were we able to provide them the resources that they needed, as well as uh, provide them with the Medicare element and the insurance element to help in the finances, but then we were also able to provide them with spa treatments. And um, I like to use three methods, rest. Do we need rest? I mean, not just, you know, sit and watch TV, totally sit down, zone out, get some rest and do some more rest and then restore, you know, find yourself some type of a therapy, drawing, walking, meditation, something to restore your soul. However, it is intentional. You have to also practice at it because the first time you do it, you may be like, what am I doing? It's not new to you, but you do have to be intentional and you do have to practice to restore the balance back to your body and your mind and then renew. Uh, research shows that rest and relaxation alone does not restore us. We need to engage in activities to renew us, to stimulate the brain and rebuild our resources. So I am so glad that um, I met Cheryl and I'm learning more that we can provide more of these resources as we continue to have more workshops for more caregivers. Yes, yes, because it is so needed, so much Absolutely. needed. So much Absolutely. for doing. I thank you so much for sharing that information with us. So next, I'm going to bring up Dr. Cynthia Fields. Dr. Fields, good evening, and how are you? Hello, Constance. I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for asking, and welcome. Thank you. I'm not a doctor yet, but that should be coming in the future. All right. So we have already put that in the atmosphere. So there you go. Well, so my um, introduction to, can you guys hear me okay? There's a bit of a delay on my end. Yeah, we, I, I can hear you, yes. Okay, all right. So um, my introduction to caregiving, well, let me back up actually. My, um, I guess, in, intro to this movement, the caregiving movement occurred in, in summer of this year when I was introduced to Sherelle um, on Clubhouse. She was speaking about caregiving and since that's my experience what I'm going through right now jumped on and I found out about the summit that she was holding over the summer so she had one in April and then I spoke at the one that occurred in July so since then I've continued to be a part of the movement so I was not an author as a part of this anthology but I was a speaker and I've become a caregiving um, advocate as a result of the summit in July and so my introduction to caregiving actually occurred when I was in junior high school and my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And um, my mother ended up becoming his caregiver and his condition progressed pretty rapidly and he became an invalid. So my mother was his primary caregiver 24 seven. So I was able to witness firsthand what she was going through, um, the challenges, the struggles that she dealt with because my father couldn't walk, he couldn't talk he couldn't feed himself. So he was solely dependent on the care of someone else. And she decided to take care of him in her home. And she did that for about a decade until he passed away. And now decades later, my mother has her own health issues that she's dealing with. She lives with my sister. And what I do, one is I help to provide respite to my sister. So I made a commitment to um, spend one weekend per month to my sister just to give her a break so she can do things for herself. And then secondly, I've helped my mother um, with taking her to her appointments. 
So she, because of the different health issues that she has, she has several appointments. And if I were not to drive her, um, there would be no one else to take her uh, to her appointments. And something that we realized last year um, as a result of COVID, there's been a caregiver shortage. And so my mother had a professional caregiver that had been working with us for about two years and she resigned in November. And when she resigned, I said, okay, well, since I'm not working, then I will fill in, right? I'll take, I'll fill in the gap until we find someone else. So here we are a year later, we have not found anyone else because the list that we receive, there are very few number of caregivers who are open to work supposedly, but then you contact them and then for whatever reason, they're not available. So just to, you know, kind of put that out there, I've found that there have been others as I've been become a part of this conversation, others have struggled with finding professional caregivers as well because the shortage is occurring across the country. So I've sort of been speaking just to try and um, share resources with individuals who are going through this on a personal level caring for a loved one, caring for a family member, um, being a voice for some of those people, because oftentimes they feel like they are experiencing this alone. They're the only one dealing with it. They deal with isolation. They deal with depression. They deal with anxiety. And so as a mental health advocate, I'm trying to share um, different resources that are available to help with that. And sometimes, you know, reaching out to speak with someone, to talk with them, with a professional, you know, mental health professional to help someone to get, just get through the day or, you know, get through a particular moment. So that's one of the reasons why I'm behind this effort is to um, help provide resources, provide encouragement, try to inspire others and help them to know they're not alone and may feel like it, um, but they're not. And also, you know, to, to just reward each other, you know, just reward each other and say thank you, you know, or recognize that I know that you, you're you doing this work, you're taking care of this person, and it takes a lot. And just to let them know that someone appreciates them because sometimes they don't even get that feedback. You know, they're putting all of this effort and energy in, but no one is providing that feedback to say, hey, I know that it's difficult. Um, I appreciate it. I see what you're doing. And what can I do to help? So that's something that I've noticed with different family members that I speak to, a lot of times they may have a big family, but they're the only one who's committed to taking care of that person. And there are not many people who are trying to, you know, say, hey, do you need a break? Do you want me to sit down? Can I clean your house? You know, can I cook you a meal? There aren't people who are offering to do that. And even when they are asking people to help, sometimes the answer is no. And then once they, they get no so many times, you know, it becomes exhausting. And so they stop asking and they give their all. And sometimes to the point where they're getting sick and if they're sick and they're not taking care of themselves, then they can't take care of their loved one. So then what happens? So I just want to help to be a part of this conversation um, and to try and spark up more willingful participation, collaboration, um, getting other family members involved so that that one person isn't feeling like they are overwhelmed because no one is trying to provide help to them. So that's basically what I'm doing. I'm also writing about this experience. Um, I wrote an article in a self, it's called the Self Care Magazine. And the title of the article is Thoughtful Holiday Gifts for Caregivers because the needs of a caregiver are going to be different than the needs of someone who is not in that type of a situation. So trying to give individuals who are not necessarily a caregiver now ideas on how they can help in a particular situation. So that's why I'm here. Well, thank you so much. And I love the idea about the thoughtful holiday gifts for caregivers. That's an excellent idea. Thank excellent you. Idea. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for what you do. Now, some of the things that I've heard from the collaborating office here on the stage, wake up call, healed, crucial decisions. All of these are true elements of being a caregiver because you see your loved one that you're caring for go through things, okay? And as you witness what they're going through and you deal with them, Sometimes it's also a healing process for yourself. You're able to shave away some layers of some things that maybe you've held on too long. 
and you're able to share those things and to shed those la those layers away. Um, the wake up call, you know, just being aware that hey, you are not superwoman. You are not a superhero. You may think you are, but you're not. And we cannot do it all. And as women, we tend to think, hey, we got this. No worry, I got it. I can do this. No, accept the help. If the help is offered, accept the help. If the help is not offered, wave your white flag and say, hey, I need some help. I need the help. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be of any good to your loved one that you're providing care to. So I thank each of you so much for being here tonight. And so, Sherelle, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sherelle D. Mims, didn't I tell you so? <laughs> Girl, come on through here, uh, Constance. And uh, yes. Dr. Rhonda Bolden is waiting in the back stage. She's on Dr. Scene. Rhonda? I've looked for her twice. Not, I, don't, I don't see her. I've looked for her twice. Okay. I don't see her. Okay, we're going to keep going then. Uh, I sent her the link. I don't know why she keep getting booted out. Yeah. Uh, I you don't mind sending her the link again? Yeah, I'll okay. send it to her again. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, wonderful people. Here we go. Y'all know who I am. I am Sherelle D. Mims. I am the founder and CEO of Global Caregivers Network and Global Caregiver Speakers. So let's talk about this for a minute. Global Caregivers Network was established in June of 2021. This is a private Facebook group where you can come in and share your issues. You can get prayer, whatever you need, it's in the house. So for those of you in the listening audience, go ahead and ask to come in to request to come in to the Global Caregivers Network and the global caregiver speakers now global caregiver speakers have it come out of the network this is a platform exclusively for caregivers where we do what we share our stories globally internationally to the masses right someone needs to hear your story someone needs to reach out to you someone is feeling some kind of way and they need someone what that they can relate to, that they can trust. You have to remember, everyone do not trust everyone. But if you can develop a, a trusting relationship with someone as a caregiver, do the same thing that you is, that is the tip of the iceberg. So guess what? All you mothers out there that think that caregiving stopped at the age of 18, <laughs> let's rethink this thing again, mothers. It has not stopped. It has just begun, okay? So caregiving, when the kids go off to college, it's just beginning, baby. Guess what? They've been up under your guidance, your husband, your father, uh, parents. They've been under your guidance for what? 18 years, 21 years. So now guess what? They go out into the real world, right? We kept them sheltered all that time. Now they leave home. They go to college and guess what they do? They still call mama. They still call daddy. They still need help. So you are still a caregiver. Come on now. Can I get an applause for the, the mothers in the house? Are all of you mothers, can I get just applause for you all being mother? Are y'all mothers, just applaud yourself because you're always going to be a mother. You're always going to be a caregiver. It does not stop. It does not stop. So for all of you on the platform, let's stay connected. Let's do what we need to do to encourage one another, to uplift one another, to let each other know, guess what? Dang, I'm just not feeling today. Can you pray for me, sis? We all have those days. And so for all of you in the, on the platform and in the listening audience, connect with me. We have some wonderful things coming out for 2023. But what we have right now that's going on is our inaugural For the Love of Caregiving anthology. And all of these ladies are in the book. Miss Judy, she's coming in the next one. It's already said, Miss Judy. <laughs> I love it. Because guess what? We all have a story to tell. 
I get so excited because I know, you know what I'm saying? When God ordained you to do something, it is done. It is done. And so I love what God is doing with this book. Listen, get your people ready. Get your tribe ready. It's coming out. I'm believing in for this week, it's coming out. Amen. That God is going to do this thing. And this is going globally and international for the love of caregivers. Get your tribe together. I know y'all been waiting. Anticipation is coming. Hold on. We got you. Get your, listen, I don't want to hear nothing when this book come out. <laughs> listen, we didn't get you ample time to get your 99 cent, get your 199. Come, in, come on through and uh, help us to make this a number one international and global bestseller. And I'm going to stop right there and I'm going to let Dr. Rhonda come on and tell her story, but I'll be back. But get your 99 cent. We're looking forward to this book becoming number one bestseller. Thank you so much, Constance. Thank you so much, Sherelle. And you heard what she said. Get your 99 cents and your 199. And as the old folks used to say, you can pick up some cans <laughs> and take care of that. <laughs> so get your funds together. Get ready. Let's make this thing global. Let's make this thing big like it's meant to be. And God has promised what he will do, but we have to work along as well for him to fulfill things within us. So thank you so much, Sherelle, for this project and for the Global Caregivers Network and all that you do for the love of caregiving. And so Dr. Rhonda Bowling, good evening. How are you? I'm fantastic. I feel like going on. This is for the caregivers. I feel like going home. Oh, trials come on every hand. I feel like going. I feel like going on. There are times I have to sing during the day, during the night. When my baby is asleep, I come in the room and I lay prostrate. I have prayer. I take communion. I anoint myself with oil to be refreshed. I play uh, Anthony Brown. I think it's um, Second Wind. It's a song called A Second Wind. And I've preached before A Second Wind to win, W-I-N. And we have to have God to breathe on us as a caregiver um, and as a woman and a woman of God. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for Sherelle asking me to be a part. Thank you all for uh, everything that... Uh, you have done to be a part of this movement. It's an honor and a blessing to be a part. Um, I, um, it was amazing how I became a caregiver, but I was looking up the word caregiver and caregiving. And I think uh, the system kicked Judy out. I, I kept getting kicked in and out, but thank God I made it. Um, but I was looking up caregiving and it's about taking care of someone or being focused and on point to uh, give the assistance that a person needs, whether it's family, friends, your job, whatever. And I was looking it up and, and uh, um, I really realized that mothers, grandmothers, dads, all of them are caregivers, even life coaches. I did coaching for women over 25 years as an elevation coach. First, I was a life coach and would help them uncover, discover, and launch their giant of potential within. And if they didn't know their purpose, that was one of my, my passions is to help them to know that if a chair 
has four purposes to sit in, stand on, lean, lean against when you're tired. And some people may pick it up and hit somebody with it, okay? But at least that chair has four purposes and nothing was created without purpose. A peanut has over 300 purposes. I loved being a life coach with women to help them to know that until you discover the purpose where God put you here, you're not going to be happy, no matter if you're married with kids, six figures, three houses, three Bentleys, it doesn't matter. Having that awareness fulfills and fills up your holes and make you whole in knowing Christ. But then later it was draining to do that. So I was, you know, studying caregiving today. And I said, wow, as a life coach, I was really a caregiver to a person's spirit. And I never thought about it like that, that even today I had a spiritual daughter, married 10 years, husband, you know, didn't want her anymore, say he really never loved her. He just used her to get through his addiction of alcohol. And she felt used and she cried with me and, you know, and just some other things she went through. And I listened and then I encouraged, I said, keep crying, get it out. I said, it's almost like going to the restroom. You've got to get it out. <laughs> Hallelujah. You have to eliminate so you can illuminate. So until you get rid of the stress and mess and the hurt and the unforgiveness, you can't move forward. So I'm sharing this because really life coaches, mentors, spiritual mothers, all of us were, are caregivers. So, but officially to a loved one, it happened in 2020. I was diagnosed. I've been a certified herbalist over 25 years. I've helped um, Vanessa Bell Armstrong is one of my clients. In fact, she just called me last week. Uh, I initially met her in 2000 on, the, on a radio show in Atlanta. And I told her what I did. And she said, I need you. And I went down to the Fox Theater to her dressing room, prayed for her and gave her some herbs. Her life changed. She had a Bell palsy attack, face straightened up. Uh, they didn't put her on dialysis like they told her in two weeks they were going to do. I said, no, we're going to get you on some cedar berries and juniper berries. You're not going to be on dialysis. We're going to pray and have faith and take these herbs and eat better and get that stress away from you. So, well, that was 2000 when I met her. She sang at our wedding, Bishop and I, and she just called me last week, some other things going on. I immediately told her, let's get you on this. Let's pray. Pray with her all as well in Jesus name. But I was into the herbs and I'm like, I got cancer. When I found a lump, I thought it was benign, thought it was a cyst and went to the doctor. Uh, well, I couldn't get into the doctor right away because of the pandemic. Everyone was closed. It grew from a grape size to over a lemon, almost an orange. In that little time where I kept calling everyone's closed, everyone's closed. So finally, a doctor uh, here in town was open and I went and got uh, checked and I was diagnosed officially. Started treatments. Um, it was shocking. Uh, wondering how and why did this happen? And I did do a fast and ask God to help me to know and the purpose. And he did reveal it. So in the midst of all of that, that was June of 2020 when I got diagnosed. Well, Bishop and I, Bishop got the virus in October 2020 and was rushed to the hospital. Oxygen went to 77. Uh, he was dehydrated. I tried to get him up out the bed. You know, doctor said, don't lay around. Um, I had to call EMS. He fell in the bathroom and they came and they said, oh, yeah, you got to go with us. Your oxygen should not be lower than 90 and then 77. Well, he went to the hospital and two days later, they called me. His oxygen went to 50. And they said, we're going to have to put him on the ventilator. So they put him on the ventilator 35 days. He uh, had a stroke while he was on the ventilator. Um, and when he came around and they ended up doing a trach later after 35 days um, and the, the journey began. And so he was in the hospital 62 days in rehab, nine weeks. And I was fighting the cancer and taking chemo and treatments and sick 30 rounds of radiation during all of this, ladies, and had a mastectomy and everything, all of this going on during this time. And I had to sing that song you heard me sing that I feel like going on. So when he came out March of 2021, 
there I was, a caregiver, never had a baby, <laughs> never caregiver. But then, as I said, I was studying and I realized that as a coach uh, to women for years, mentor, spiritual mom, um, that I was literally caring for their spirit and their soul and not maybe their bodies, but I did also help a lot of people, Dottie Peoples, uh, Les Brown, when he had prostate cancer in the 90s before he married Gladys, he was one of my clients, we're very good friends, did some work with him. So I guess as a herbalist, I was a caregiver in helping them to get back to health, but I didn't have to help them to the restroom and take them to doctor's appointments. But over the phone, I tried to give them hope and to believe with them in prayer that God was going to heal them and through his herbs. So that was my journey. And it has been incredible. I've learned a lot. I've learned that I have to take naps. <laughs> a nap is anointed. <laughs> And I take naps. I also go get a massage. That's what I would like to do for caregivers is give them a massage once a month or every other month because I'll get an 80 minute with the hot towels, not the stones. And I feel like a new person, the girl that does it. So I, I just encourage people who are caregivers to um, care for yourself and then you Remember to put yourself in their shoes. My husband and I would, would play golf. He'd play golf two or three times a week. We played tennis. We would work out at the gym just about every day. He was very active. And he's uh, 17 years older than me. He's 74. I'm 57. And he was more energetic than me. But this happened and his whole life changed. So imagine how he feels. So sometimes when we get a little short or impatient, we have to kind of do a jap slap. You know, come on, shake out of it and really begin to give the love and care as if we're caring for God, because he is God, a man of God. So that's my story. And my uh, chapter title is A Tenacious Journey. I made it. Oh, excuse me. My Tenacious Journey. I made it. And so can you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, number one, for the beautiful song. You just didn't sing it long enough. Amen. I, I didn't want to take up all the time. <laughs> okay. You know, and we needed that encouragement. And I'm sure there was someone in the listening audience that needed that push as well. Because, you know, as Apostle Paul says, we have to encourage ourselves. Yes. And so there are there are days you just feel like, and especially when I, I know when I was caregiving, I'm like, Lord, how am I gonna make it through this day? And I just had to push myself and say, You're gonna make it. You're gonna make it. So keep there's going. a couple other songs I wanna I wanna suggest to caregivers sure. to you. One is called Help. And I'm looking to write a book titled just plainly help with three exclamation points. But the song is by Vanessa Bar Armstrong. Please, you guys, when we get done go YouTube, iTunes, whatever, but it's called help. Oh, okay. And then the other one is the lifter of my head by, um, um, oh God, just, the, he has a group, um, a choir. You guys know, of, um, mm, Ricky Dillard. Oh, I almost, <laughs> yeah. And it's called the lifter of my head. And that song just refreshes me so much. So I wanted to give those two other suggestions to you and everybody that listens to this recording. I thank you so much for sharing that with us. I thank you so much. Your story is totally amazing. Yes, God. It really is. It's totally amazing just to think that in the midst of all that you were going through your personal trials, you didn't have time to sit back and wallow in pity. You had the man of God to take care of. That's right, my baby. Yeah, <laughs> right. baby you, had to, you had to see about the man of God. And so I commend you for what you did. I'm sure God has already rewarded you over and over again you, for being that ride or die chick for your husband, for being the help meet that you were supposed to be and for standing by his side through sickness and in health. So I thank you so much. I thank you so much. And so I'm going to just kind of do a round robin and start with Dr. Gorman. 
Um, do you have any final words or thoughts you would like to add to our discussion tonight? Yes. Okay. Can y'all hear me? <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, so yes, my I didn't get. I don't think I got a chance to tell you what my title was. It's actually uh, five rela relaxation tips for the caregiver, and one of the things I just wanted to stress is that uh, relaxation strategies can actually be different for different people. For example, what causes someone else to have, you know, great relaxation and, and helps with their stress can cause stress for another person. For example, um, someone just talked about having a uh, massage. Personally, for me, that's my ultimate form of relaxation. I love it, but other people don't like to be touched and so it kind of can stress them out, you know what I mean? So one of the things I would like to really encourage is to find stress reduction techniques that are beneficial for you and try different things. Um, another example is one of the things I love to do is uh, color. And you know, I, I can block out everything. I can just focus on creating something beautiful. Whereas other people trying to stay in between the lines really stresses them out. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, if you happen to color with the person you're taking care of, it could be a bonding moment. But that for other people, it may not be. So just encourage yourself alone or with your your, your liege, whoever you're, you're taking care of, to find different techniques that can be beneficial for you because chronic stress is literally and figuratively a killer. So that's what I wanted to just impart with y'all tonight. Just find something that's beneficial for you that can help you with your relaxation and your stress reduction, because it literally is a killer. And you're absolutely, absolutely right. We have to find that one thing that really helps us to just decompress. For me, now I love a massage. I love it. But for me, it's going out there on that fish bank <laughs> and fishing. Yeah, no. I can stay, I can stay <laughs> out there all day. I don't care if I catch anything. That's okay. I'm out there on the water enjoying the peace and the quietness. And that is so relaxing to me. So and I like, you know, you mentioned about the coloring and the bonding effect that it has. I can remember as a child, my mom used to color with me. But I, I, I had to fire her because she wanted to tell me how to color. <laughs> and you know, well, that's not that 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 color doesn't make any sense for that. Well, it makes sense to me. So I'm like, you know what? I don't want you to be my color buddy anymore. I want to color by myself, but it was a great bonding experience. And so you're absolutely right. So I'm it's been a long time since I've heard somebody even mention coloring. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Very Cynthia, good. share with us any last minute things you have to say. Uh, so what I'd like to say, um, a lot of times when I talk about caregiving, I'm speaking on behalf of caregivers and I'm speaking to individuals who may, they may not be caregivers themselves, but they know someone who is. So for those who are listening, you heard that caregivers like massages, they need self-care, they might want to go fishing, they might want to go shopping, but oftentimes they need help in order to be able to do that. They need someone to come in and fill in for them while they step away from their loved one. So look at those people in your lives and figure out a way that you can help them to get the self-care that they need. For someone who's not taking care of someone, it's easy to say, okay, I'll get a mani-pedi or I'll go to a movie. But if there's someone who's taking care of someone else, they can't just easily go and do those things if they don't have someone who's there to help them, to give them a break, to help to provide some respite. So that's one thing I would say. The other thing that I would say as a Christian, um, for those of you who are Christians, who are believers, stay in your word. You know, I talked before about it can be an isolating experience. You can feel depressed. You can feel um, anxious. You can feel depleted, deflated. Stay in the word for your encouragement. And as Rhonda said, sometimes you have to encourage yourself, like Yolanda Adams, that song, Sometimes you have to encourage yourself because there's no one else there to encourage you. Mm -hmm. So stay on top of that because you want to stay on top of your mental health. Amen. Thank you, Keisha. Yeah, I uh, I just diddle everything that Cynthia was saying because that was just in my heart. And when you are in, when you are a caregiver, it is so difficult to get those 
steal away moments for yourself because you're in the middle of it. But I thought about uh, something that I wanted to know for mine. I'll just, I want to read a poem that I had written titled You're a Caregiver, and I always dedicate this to caregivers. It's, um, I want you to know I see you getting tired. I want you to know I can feel your weight. I want you to know I can hear you thinking, how much more can I take? Hold on, be strong, don't quit, don't give up, don't give in. Even when decisions you make break your heart, remember you're a caregiver, remember you're a caregiver. There are arms open to hug your fears. There's a breeze stirring to dry your tears. There's a rainbow coming to brighten your world. There are oceans calming to give you a pearl. There are raindrops falling to water your bloom. There are waves parting to give you some room. There are trees bending that owe you shade. There's time waiting for the sacrifices you made. Remember you're a caregiver. Remember you're a caregiver. Wow, wow. And I love that. Beautiful, poem. beautiful. Trees bending that owe you shade. I love that. Go, girl. Trees bending that owe you shade. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you so much, Keisha, for sharing that with us. Thank you so much. Dr. Rhonda. Yes, I just um, want to say, um, as the as Cynthia said, I didn't mention it, but the word and prayer, uh, as you heard me say, sometime I come in here in the middle of before day in the morning when it's quiet, I write. That helps me. I listen to audio books and I love music. Um, it is a help as well. Um, and I love to drink chamomile tea. <laughs> it, it calms me. It, it helps during the day and at night to sleep well. You've got to get a good night's rest mm -hmm. and endeavor to ask God to wake you up before the one you care for. Mm -hmm. And when I try to get up early sometimes, he may get up a little earlier than normal. And I'm doing my devotional with God, getting refueled. Um, and then I have to, he says, you know, he'll call my name and, you know, take me to the restroom or whatever. And so I'll try to take care of him. And then I'll say, once he's set, I need to go back to my devotional because that devotional does something for me. It's like a spiritual premium unleaded gas mm -hmm. station yes. <laughs> yes. where I can fill up, not with regular, but premium unleaded. Yes. Because a Rolls Royce, you're all Rolls Royces in the Lord, rich queens, and you need premium unleaded. And so a word from the Lord. I heard a prophetess this evening. I was telling Bishop, talking about creativity. And that's one of my areas of anointing that God has placed on my life. So I had to hear that word from her while I was cooking dinner so I could be on here with you guys. Because I wanted to make sure his, he had his dinner before 730. But I had that earphone in and listened to that sister speaking into our lives. And I said, I, I put, I took a minute from blackening the catfish. I was blackening the catfish and putting a little, little cooking wine on it, you know, white wine on it. And then I, I, I paused for a minute. I, I, I typed in there, preach girl. <laughs> and then I went back to cook it, you know. So I'm telling you, get, get that word. Um, Yes. Declare declarations. I'm healthy, wealthy, wise, and on the rise. I remember when the Lord uh, touched me, uh, told me to publish four books and three CDs all on the same day. That happened February 3rd, 2007, here in Fort Wayne at the Hilton Hotel. Three different, I mean, excuse me, four different books and three CDs. And one of the CDs was a cappella hymns. Like you heard me sing, I did 16 hymns in a medley. And I could not keep the CD because people loved it. No background singers, no music. But he told me to do all of this and release it on the same day. So when I get ready to write, I'm falling asleep. And I call my spiritual mother and say, baby, uh, mom, you got to pray for me. I keep falling asleep. And I just woke up from a good night's sleep. It's the devil. And this is a declaration God gave me. And I give it to you all. I have the strength of God. So I will walk in the strength of God, because I am the strength of God. I am only because of the great, I am. And when I would say that and read Ecclesiastes 7, 8, finishing is better than starting and patience is better than pride, I would, the Lord would give me strength. When I say that declaration, read that scripture, I had it right in front of me and the Lord blessed me to get those four different books 
and three CDs finished and they were on the table at the Hilton on February 3rd, 2007 here in Fort Wayne. So get the strength you need, say the declarations, read the word, listen to the, uh, the music, do whatever you need to do, but know that there is help around you. I asked people for help a few months ago. They're now coming over two times a week to help me. Mm -hmm. So I, you have to ask for help. Ask the Savior to help you, but you got to ask some people who are here physically as God's represent, rep, representatives to help you. God bless. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Rana. Thank you so much for sharing that. Matus. Yes, I have three things that I'd share with uh, our listeners. And that is for those of you who are caregivers, if someone comes to help you, accept the help, unless it's for one a good reason or not, accept the help. Because that is really a, a, a blessing that's coming to you for someone who's going to help stay there and sit with someone so that you can do something else. The other thing that I would say for those who may be caregivers and also those who are not caregivers and those who is just there's I have a three P plan, which is prepare plan to prevent the extra stress. And we can do that by right now preparing that legal paperwork that you need to have in place in case you or a loved one gets sick. Have advanced directives. Know who you, who the attorneys and the physicians and the medications are. Make do those plans now before the time comes because that will help you to not at least have that stressor to deal with. And then talk to your family members so that they know where all this information is. So that's my prevent plan and to pre, that's my plan prepare to prevent the extra stress. And then last but not least, I think I piggyback piggyback on some of the other. But some of the other ladies have said, and that is be aware of how of your thoughts and the people that you hang around with stay positive. That may come through scripture. It may come through reading. It may come through music. But even if it's family members, try to stay away from as negative people as much as possible, because that will weigh on you. All of those will help you be a better caregiver. Amen. Thank you so much, Matus. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Sherelle, didn't I tell you so, Mims? Come on and give us some final closing thoughts. <laughs> Y'all better know, didn't I tell you? Y'all better, <laughs> I'm telling you, it is so real out here. You know what? Everyone has did a phenomenal job, ladies. And those in the listening audience, just give yourself a hand. Y'all did excellent. Y'all did phenomenal. Y'all share what you needed to share. So just give yourselves a hand. But what I want to say is this. You know, everyone has did a phenomenal job, right, in sharing their stories. They snip it from the book. And I want to just say, uh, say something about uh, Matus. You know, I went to go visit my uh, mother this weekend. I'm not her caregiver, but I am her caregiver, right, because they always call and ask you questions about different things. And, uh, you know, we told I had this conversation, Matus, about uh, the paperwork, insurance and things like that. So my mom, my mom, she was sitting in the chair and she called. She said, Sherelle, I don't know why. She, I mean, she just, here's the insurance policy. And I'm thinking, what? You know, I know this is something we have to do, right? But uh, my mother brought out the insurance policies today. And I know, I know where they are, but this particular day on my birthday, she brought out these insurance policies and wanted me to know where they're located, where they're at. If you don't know, my mom has had, uh, she had a heart attack. They said it wasn't a heart attack, but they had to put stents in, right? But uh, Constance and I, if you're in the medical field and Dr. Dietrichs, we know the underlying, you know what I'm saying? They may not say a heart attack, however, it was what it was, but it kind of threw me off today, right? Because she did it in such a subtle way that she wanted me to know where these policies was at. Just like Mady said, get the paperwork in order. My mom is in her 70s, late 70s. So she's, I don't know, she's preparing and we always talk. So these are the conversations you need to be having. These are real conversations. And so whatever my mother thought process was, 
I acknowledged it, respect it, and we have to do what we have to do. These are real life conversations that you need to be having, especially if your parents or your loved one is over the age of 60, 70, especially over the age of 70. So these, like I said, these are real conversations. So with that being said, I just want to uh, close out by saying this. You know, Rosalind Carter said it best. You know, there are only four types of people in the world. There's, a, there's only four types of caregivers in the world. Number one, those who have been caregivers. Two, those who have, those who are caregivers. Three, those who will be caregivers. And then number four, those who are going to need a caregiver. I heard some of you say on the panel that you don't, you hope that you never need a caregiver. And right now we all do not need a caregiver. However, looking towards the future, we are a caregiver right now. There's only four types of people in the world. That's it. Put yourself in one of those categories and, and cross over. Because a lot of us are what? We are caregivers. We may need a caregiver. We need someone to step in for us. We still need respite care. So that's part of what? Needing a caregiver. With all of that being said, I thank everyone for coming out tonight. And listen, let's not forget what's going on around us. There are a lot of resources out there. I mean, we can go on and on and on talking about resources. You can Google anything you want related to caregiving. So for those of those on the panel, those in the listening audience, Google anything you want. Yes, we have resources. We can ramble them off, but everyone is an individual. It's an individual thing. You may not need the resources I help. Of course, we know all about dementia, Alzheimer, all of that is out there. Stress release, right? We need stress relief. We need to listen to YouTube, meditation music. All of that plays a part. Let's keep ourselves. Self-care is the number one priority. And we know this, right? Made us have a book out and we all do self-care. We're going to continue to do self-care. And with that being said, I'm going to end this by saying this. Follow any of us on Facebook, Instagram. Sherelle D. Mims. You can find me on Facebook, Sherelle D. Mims, Global Caregivers Network, and Global Caregiver Speakers. You can email me, Sherelle at globalcaregivers.net. And listen, let's get back to the phone. 260 218 That's my story, as Les Brown say, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. You can catch the replay. Where at, Constance? Go okay. ahead, Constance. You can hear it on YouTube. We're streaming live now, but you can also pull it up on YouTube at thespeakeasy.com. I'm, no, I'm sorry, the Speakeasy Podcast, D-P-R-E-A-Z-Y. And you can pull it up there. You can also stream it on Spotify under the Speakeasy Podcast. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's also available on Audible under Constance Woolard. And it's also available on LinkedIn under Constance Woolard. So there's several places that you can go and listen to this broadcast and the other series, series we've had before on caregiving. Because we have had mm -hmm. something every week this month in celebration of caregivers. So yes. I thank each of you for helping me to promote and celebrate caregivers this month. November is National Caregivers Month, but caregiving does not end when November ends. Caregiving, <laughs> continues. caregiving continues and always will continue. So keep that in mind. Just because November ends on Tuesday, caregiving does not end. You know, I used to tell my son on the holidays when I would go to work, well, you have to go to work today. Today is a holiday. I said, well, yeah, honey, the people don't get well because it's a holiday. <laughs> they are still sick, so I have to go to work. So just because November is ending, caregiving is not ending. Caregiving is here with us and is here to stay. And as Sherelle said, at some point, 
we will either be a caregiver, will have been a caregiver, or will need a caregiver. And so I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I want to thank my wonderful guests for joining. And until the next time here at the Speak Easy, may God continue to bless you richly today, tomorrow, and always, and have a good evening. And thank you to my guests once again. Thank you, Constance, for having us. You're welcome. Good night, everyone. Thank you all for coming in. Thank you. Thank you.